What's up, guys? Benson here, and welcome to my channel. So sometimes when you want to tune your musical instrument but don't have the electronic tuner around, you might want to try the old-fashioned way to use a tuning fork. Other ways of using the fork is to hit it and then put it on the instrument. You can also do it on the bridge if you don't want to hurt the varnish. Or anywhere that you think is a good idea to make contact with the instrument. This effect is called resonance. The violin is in resonance with the tuning fork and amplify the resonant frequency. So that is why you hear a louder pitch. But in this case, we have to contact the violin with the tuning fork, right? What about without contact? The sound gets transported to the other through resonance and back again. As you can see, if we have two tuning forks uh, with the same resonant frequency, then we can actually transfer the resonant frequency of one fork to the other one without contact. But why I'm talking about this, the tuning fork, it sounds like a totally different story to uh, the Cubia technology, right? Keep watching, I'll tell you everything. Superconducting Cubia is not like any other type of Cubia technology. It's actually made out of a resonant circuit. Looks something like this. This circuit is composed of one inductor and one capacitor in parallel. When the electric current flows through the inductor, it can convert the current to a magnetic field and store the energy in a coil. Capacitor, on the other hand, can store the electrical energy or say, the charges. So if we connect these two together, the stored electrical energy can be released from the capacitor and induce magnetic fields in inductor. In this process, the electrical energy is transferred from the capacitor to the inductor. After all the electrical energy was transferred, the inductor will in turn transfer all the energy back to capacitor. So this process is like electrical energy is oscillating within the circuit and after some mathematical transformation, the energy can be plotted like this. Yes, the energies are quantized and are divided into different levels. So we can use the different level, uh, different energy levels to represent different computational bases. For example, assign the lowest two levels as 0 and 1. Don't panic, this notation is called direct notation and are used to represent quantum state of the qubit. Let's make an analogy. As human beings, we have two states, alive and dead, right? And for qubit, it has two quantum states, 0 and 1. Okay, back on track. We can assign the lowest two levels as 0 and 1. But the problem of this is, because the circuit is an electrical resonator, right? And it has this resonant frequency. This frequency is relevant to the energy level. If we use resonant microwave signal to change the circuit frequency to further drive transition between zero and one, because the energy gap between energy levels are the same, right? And the resonant microwave signal we are using only has one transition frequency. Chances are the energy can be excited to higher levels so we cannot know which energy level we are at. To solve this, people use a special inductor called Josephson Junction to replace the common linear inductor in the circuit. And by doing this, the energy level gaps are changed. The lowest two energy levels are isolated from the rest of the energy levels, since the energy level gaps are different. So in this way, we can control the energy to stay at two lowest levels. This type of qubit is called transpon qubit, which is the most classical qubit in a big superconducting qubits family. And IBM is one of the giant tech companies using the transpon qubit, and they put an anatomical diagram on their website. This is not a drone. I was mistaken by first glance. The center part is qubit itself, and these three cotton bus looking things their capacitive coupling, which can allow for the microwave to control the qubit. Okay, let's stop here. Do you remember the tuning fork? And the qubit itself is actually a resonant circuit and has its own frequency. So for tuning fork, the resonant frequency, which is in the form of sound, can be transferred from one fork to the other. Similarly for qubit, the resonant frequency, which is in the form of microwave signal, 
can be transferred from the microwave resonator to the qubit. Therefore, we can change the qubit frequency to the value we want and further set the qubit to 0 or 1. Now you can see how the superconducting qubits share the same techniques with the tuning fork. Here's another question. Why we call it superconducting qubit? Well, because both the capacitor and the Josephson junction, the inductor, are made of superconductors, such as niobium, so that is why we call it superconducting qubit. But the further question is, how can we put the qubits into superposition? Since the superposition and entanglement are the most important features of qubits, usually we use gates. Gates are like the vivid name that we use to describe the operation over qubits. So change the qubit state from 0 to 1 by changing its frequency. Gates can operate on 1 qubit or 2 qubits, and we can also call it single qubit gate and 2 qubit gate. These gates that I can show you later are realized by microwave signal. For example, Hadmer gate is a single qubit gate. When I apply this gate to qubit state 0, the state would turn into the superposition state of 0 and 1, 50% respectively. Aside from superposition, another feature is called entanglement. And for entanglement, it's time to use the 2 qubit gate on 2 qubits to entangle them, right? Such as control NOT gate, also called the C NOT gate. And to better demonstrate, I'm going to show you uh, the gate operation on IBM's Quantum Composer. This is the interface. You can either code in the right section or drag and drop the gates directly on the circuit. This Q stands for qubit, and number beside it is the mark of the qubit, not the state of the qubit. Q0 is the first qubit, and I can increase the number of qubits by pressing this plus icon. This C is the classical register. Every time we make a measurement, the measurement result will be recorded as a classical bit on the classical register. Okay, since we learn the basics, we can start now. We use one qubit first. The initial state of every qubit is zero, but we can use gates to change it. For example, this NOT gate is also called X gate, X. If we apply X gate on this qubit, the state of the qubit would turn into 1. And you can see as I drag the NOT gate on the circuit, the code in the editor is X. So you can remember, right? NOT gate is also called X gate. And that is why you cannot find X gate in audio gates because it's NOT gate, but you can still find the Y and Z gate. But what if I want to put this qubit into superposition? I can use the hammer gate which is this red H over here. If I drag uh, the red H to the qubit, I can notice that the qubit state changes to the superposition state of 0 and 1. 50% of 0 and 50% of 1. Next, let's do entanglement. This time we use two different qubits because we cannot entangle qubit with itself, right? We have to use at least two qubits. Okay, watch. I drag hammer gate to qubit 0 and control NOT gates to both qubits. Boom, these two are entangled. I'm pretty sure I have one question in mind right now. How can you tell these two qubits are entangled? Okay, let's recall first, what is entanglement? If we want to get the result that we want, instead of the random results, we have to use something called entanglement. And entanglement will happen between two or more qubits so now I will use these two coins to demonstrate this entanglement. Imagine these two spinning coins are two qubits and they're entangled. If I measure the value of one of the qubits, the other one will collapse to a specific value at the same time, which means these two qubits are linked. If we measure one qubit state, the other one will also change, right? Let's measure the state of qubit zero. The other one also changes, right? So these two qubits are entangled. So we know the gates can put our qubits into superposition and can also entangle our qubits. Different from the noise in classical computer that we can easily handle, the noise in quantum computer is quite different and hard to mitigate. But what exactly is this noise? A common definition in quantum computer is 
Noise is the probability that applying gate yields an incorrect state. So basically, it means when you apply the gate on one qubit for a thousand times, 100 out of them are incorrect. So the noise is 10%. But what causes the noise in quantum computers? There are three main causes. I think the first one is the materials problem. Because the Josephson junction, if you remember, is an oxide dielectric layer sandwiched between two superconducting metals. This layer allows the electrons to tunnel through from the top metal to the bottom metal. And the thickness of this oxide layer is highly related to the qubit resonant frequency. But based on now this fabrication technique, we cannot make it super smooth. And this layer varies from qubit to qubit, which means every qubit frequency is different. So if we use the same microwave signal to control it, it can generate errors. The second cause is dissipation. We all know that the resistance in circuit can generate heat. That is why our phones or computers will heat up if we are using them. And the heat will cause dissipation of energy. Since our qubit is basically a resonant circuit, if it has resistance, the energy oscillated inside can spread away, then the qubit frequency would change accordingly, right? That is why we use superconductors, which have nearly zero resistance, but in reality, superconductors are not 100% superconducting and there are still some dissipation happening. The last one is, why we are controlling the qubit? We use microwave. But because microwave fields extend away from the qubit plane by approximately 100 millimeters, so this extended fields can affect other qubits and sometimes even change the states of other qubits that we don't want. Noise is very important and troublesome since it can lead to the decoherence of qubits. But here are some possible solutions for longer coherence time. Recent study shows that the transmit qubit made of tantalum can improve the coherence time of the qubit that's a good news, and we can keep searching for new materials to replace the older niobium. Another demonstration is the gate mon qubit. This type of qubit uses a semiconducting tunnel barrier instead of oxide dielectric layer that transmon qubit uses. And this type of qubit is promising because the tunneling layer is semiconductor, so we can use voltage to tune the frequency of the qubits, and that's a more accurate and practical method. As you can see from the previous section, the transmon qubit is like the first generation of the superconducting qubit, the older version. It has one fatal issue, the noise. But this issue can be solved by either changing the material or even replace the oxide dielectric layer with the semiconductors. So in some ways, the noise is actually not a big deal. The real big deal, or say, the imperfection of transmon qubit, is that it's hard to swap the energy between two transmon qubits, and it's hard to isolate one transmon qubit with another one. And this is mainly because the transmon qubit frequency is not tunable. So people came up with other superconducting qubit architecture to overcome these issues. And this is when the cousin of transmon qubit comes in the flux qubit. The only one difference of flux qubit and transmon qubit is that the flux qubit replaces the Josephson junction with a loop with the symmetrically shunted Josephson junctions. Look like this. The reason why it's called flux qubit is that this qubit frequency is tunable and can be controlled by magnetic flux. And this asymmetrically shunted Josephson junctions can reduce the qubit sensitivity to this flux noise. But most importantly, this architecture can further isolate the lowest two energy levels. So you can regard the flux qubit as the second generation or the improved version of transmon qubit. But either way, whether transmon qubit or flux qubit, they're all important in superconducting qubit technology. And we look forward to a more advanced, like a third generation of superconducting qubit. And hopefully you can not only solve the noise issues, but also have the tunable frequency. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you guys for watching and catch you guys in my next one.